Bonjour. Je vous souhaite bienvenue à ce service pour Vendredi Saint. I welcome you to this Good Friday service as we come to the very heart of the Christian story. While we learn from all that Jesus did and said during his ministry, it was at the cross where he died that we see most fully who he was. We can name him teacher for what he said, healer for what he did, but at the cross, we name him as savior. The prophet Isaiah wrote about the suffering servant. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with grief. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Let us worship God, and let us pray. Ever-living and ever-loving God, how frayed our lives have become. A collection of loose ends, tarnished glories, and hazy dreams. We admit that we find it difficult to keep our eyes fixed on Christ's cross and to listen to his dying voice. So too we turn away from the places where he continues to be crucified today, in nursing homes and long-term health facilities, on First Nations reserves, in back alleys, behind closed doors, in torture chambers and on fields of battle. Stretch our boundaries, stir our hearts, and inflame our passion to behold you in every fragment of life, to feel you in every moment of time, and to serve you in every occasion with obedience and joy. And now together we join in Jesus' prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
So much has changed for us in this past year. One of the things is this. We have all become accustomed to putting on a mask whenever we are likely to encounter others in close proximity. We wear masks in hospitals, in stores, on buses and metros. Masks when we walk down the crowded streets. Masks if someone comes to the door. It's now becoming difficult to imagine not wearing masks in public. But while physically wearing a mask is new for us, we spend our lifetimes wearing them to hide who we really are. We often pretend to be confident, bright, capable people in order to hide our low self-esteem, our confusion, our shame. We smile when we're sad. We act confident when we're lost. We try to look normal when we're falling apart. We pretend to be concerned when really we could care less. We look under control, even when we don't have a clue. The passion story of Jesus' arrest, trial, and crucifixion is one in which Jesus was not only seeing behind the masks that people were wearing, he was removing them and exposing the real faces that lay beneath. It is a story that exposes our own failures as we try so desperately to hide who we are. Today we will listen to the Passion story read in five parts. After each, there will be short meditations, both in word and in music. So let us listen for the word of God, and let us be prepared to be unmasked. The first reading is from Mark 14, verses 10 to 31. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to portray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never drink of the fruit of the vine again until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and Jesus said to them, 
you will all become deserters, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this day, this very night before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. The disciples were sure that they were ready for anything, that they would stand firm for what was right, that they would protect their teacher from those who opposed him, that they would fight back against the forces who threatened the path to a better day. They were convinced that they would stick to their principles, come what may, and were strong enough to resist those who were out to destroy the coming of the new kingdom that Jesus was proclaiming. And they were certain that God was on their side. They had seen it with their own eyes as they traveled the dusty roads of Palestine and saw how Jesus changed lives. They wore their masks of courage proudly, not knowing that they would crumble to reveal faces of fear when the cost of courage became clear. It's easy to feel bold as long as courage isn't tested. It's easy to make grandiose statements about what we stand for. This realm of God where everyone has a place at the table and no one is excluded. But what do we do when hatred or power confronts our lofty dreams of a better tomorrow? What do we do when we encounter racism, sexism, homophobia, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, either in its blatant or subtle forms? Do we speak up? Or does our mask of courage wither away to expose the fear that was there all along?
La deuxième leçon est du livre de Saint Marc, chapitre 14, versets 32 à 52. Ils se rendirent ensuite dans un endroit appelé Gethsémani, et Jésus dit à ses disciples, « Asseyez-vous ici pendant que je prierai. » Il prit avec lui Pierre, Jacques et Jean, et il commença à être saisi de frayeur et d'angoisse. Il leur dit, « Mon âme est triste à en mourir. Restez ici et veillez. » Puis il avança de quelques pas, se jeta contre terre et pria que, si cela était possible, cette heure s'éloigne de lui. Il disait, « Abba, Père, tout est possible. Éloigne de moi cette coupe. Toutefois, non pas ce que je veux, mais ce que tu veux. » Il vint vers les disciples qu'il trouva endormis et il dit à Pierre, « Simon, tu dors. Tu n'as pas pu rester éveillé une seule heure. » Restez vigilants et priez pour ne pas céder à la tentation. L'esprit est bien disposé, mais par nature, l'homme est faible. » Il s'éloigna de nouveau et fit la même prière. Il revint et les trouva encore endormis, car ils avaient les paupières lourdes. Ils ne surent que lui répondre. Il revint pour la troisième fois et leur dit, « Vous dormez maintenant et vous vous reposez. C'est assez. L'heure est venue. » Voici que le Fils de l'homme est livré entre les mains des pécheurs. Levez-vous, allons-y, celui qui me trahit s'approche. » Il parlait encore quand soudain arriva Judas, l'un des douze, avec une foule armée d'épées et de bâtons envoyés par les chefs des prêtres, par les spécialistes de la loi et par les anciens. Celui qui le trahissait leur avait donné ce signe. « L'homme auquel je donnerai un baiser, c'est lui. Arrêtez-le !» et amenez-le sous bonne garde. » Dès qu'il fut arrivé, il s'approcha de Jésus en disant « Maître » et il l'embrassa. Alors ces gens mirent la main sur Jésus et l'arrêtèrent. L'un de ceux qui étaient là tira l'épée, frappa le serviteur du grand prêtre et lui emporta l'oreille. Jésus prit la parole et leur dit «« Vous êtes venus vous emparer de moi avec des épées et des bâtons, comme pour un brigand. J'étais tous les jours parmi vous, enseignant dans le temple, et vous ne m'avez pas arrêté. Mais c'est afin que les Écritures soient accomplies. » Alors tous l'abandonnèrent et prirent la fuite. Un jeune homme le suivait, habillé d'un simple drap. On l'attrapa, mais il lâcha le drap et se sauva tout nu. We don't know who he was, where he came from, what he was doing there, or where he went. He's simply described as a young man and a disciple, nothing more, no name, no background. When the authorities came to arrest Jesus, he was left behind while the others fled. But then, in his desperation, he too ran naked as they tried to grab him and caught only the clothes he was wearing. It wasn't only his face that it was exposed then, when his mask of loyalty fell off. Indeed, everything was. This is a story of betrayal, of disciples through their apathy in the garden, of Peter lying to save himself, of Judas betraying Jesus' trust and friendship, and of this unknown young man leaving everything behind when trouble began. We too pledge our loyalty to others, to our spouses, to our families, to our friends, to church, to principles, to Jesus. We too claim allegiance and promise to be there through thick and thin for those who matter to us most. But those masks also come off when loyalty is confronted with self-interest. It may not be as dramatic as when lives are threatened, but have we not also let others down? Have we not let ourselves down when it's more convenient to put aside our noble claims for more selfish pursuits? How many times have we justified compromising loyalty to our lofty principles? because another path was easier and promised more.
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And also far from my cry and from the words of my distress. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. By night as well, but I find no rest. Yet you are the Holy One. Enthroned upon the praises of Israel, our forefathers put their trust in you. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried out to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not put to shame. But as for me, I am a worm and no man, scorned by all and despised by the people. All who see me laugh me to scorn. They curl their lips and wag their heads, saying, He trusted in the Lord, let him deliver him. Let him rescue him if he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb and kept me safe upon my mother's breast. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. You were my God when I was still in my mother's womb. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. The third lesson is from Mark, chapter 14, verses 53 to 72. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another, not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some became, began to spit on him and to blindfold him and to strike him, saying to him, Prophecy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were with Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you are talking about. And he went out into the forecourt. Then the cock crowed. 
And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore on oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment, the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. I have always pictured the scene as chaotic, loud voices vying for attention, witnesses being pushed forward, a sense of danger and violence in the air. But maybe it was as orderly as a sleepy courtroom on an ordinary Friday morning, with the presiding judge, wigged lawyers, bored onlookers, and a shackled defendant. Each had their predetermined part to play in this drama. Each had their mask to wear to show their role. When the script was read and the performance enacted, while it looked like it mattered, in fact the outcome was never in doubt. It had all been decided before anyone even entered the courtroom. It gave the appearance of truth being adjudicated, but quite the opposite took place. The masks of truth were only deceptions to hide the distortions that would serve the purposes of the powerful. By refusing to play the role that he was assigned, Jesus made it clear that this was a court better set up to judge kangaroos than messiahs. We wear society's mask that claims the lies that there are equal opportunities for all, that people will be judged on their own abilities, that no meritocracy even exists. The masks obscure the reality of women who keep running into glass ceilings, of people of color being treated differently by police, criminal courts, and HR departments, of those with physical or emotional disabilities being refused opportunities awarded to others, of those who look like they don't belong not finding a welcome in a church. As Leonard Cohen once sang, everybody knows the dice are loaded. Everybody rolls with their fingers crossed. Everybody knows the fight was fixed. The poor stay poor and the rich get rich. And of course, we are happy to keep it that way when it's to our benefit.
La quatrième leçon est du livre de Saint Marc, chapitre 15, versets 1 à 21. Dès le matin, les chefs des prêtres tinrent conseil avec les anciennes, les spécialistes de la loi et tout le Sanhédrin. Après avoir attaché des Jésus, ils les menèrent et ils le livrèrent à Pilate. Pilate l'interrogea. « Es-tu le roi des Juifs? » Jésus lui répondit, « Tu le dis. » Les chefs des prêtres portaient contre lui beaucoup d'accusations. Pilate interrogea de nouveau. « Ne réponds-tu rien? Vois tous les témoignages qu'ils portent contre toi. » Mais Jésus ne répondit plus rien, ce qui étonne Pilate. À chaque fête, il relâcha un prisonnier, celui que le peuple réclamait. Il y avait en prison le dénommé Barabbas avec ses complices pour un meurtre qu'il avait commis lors d'une émeute. La foule se mit à demander à grands cris ce qu'il avait l'habitude de leur accorder. Pilate leur répondit, « Voulez-vous que je vous le rache le roi des Juifs? » En effet, il savait que c'était par jalousie que les chefs des prêtres avaient fait arrêter Jésus. Cependant, les chefs des prêtres exitèrent la foule afin que Pilate leur relâche plutôt par avance. Pilate reprit la parole et leur dit, « Que voulez-vous donc que je fasse de celui que vous appelez le roi des Juifs? » Ils crièrent de nouveau, « Crucifie-le! »« Quel mal a-t-il fait? » leur dit Pilate. Ils crièrent encore plus fort, « Crucifie-le » Voulant satisfaire la foule, Pilate leur relâcha par la basse, et après avoir fait fouetter Jésus, il le livra à la crucifixion. Les soldats conduisirent Jésus à l'intérieur de la cour, c'est-à-dire dans le prétoire, et ils rassemblèrent toute la troupe. Ils lui mirent un habit pourpre et posèrent sur sa tête une couronne d'épines qu'il avait tressée. Puis ils se mirent à le saluer. « Salut, roi des Juifs !» Ils lui frappaient la tête avec un roiseau, crachaient sur lui et se mettaient à genoux pour se prosterner devant lui. Après s'être ainsi moqué de lui, ils lui enlevèrent l'habit pourpre, lui remirent ses vêtements et les manèrent pour le crucifier. Ils forcèrent un passant qui revenait des champs à porter, à porter la croix de Jésus. C'était Simon de Cyrène, le père d'Alexandre, et de Rufus. It was perfectly clear who held the power once the authorities had dragged Jesus to the palace where Pilate resided. No one was more powerful than the Roman governor. Life and death were in his hands and everyone knew it. The Jewish authorities, the supporters who had gathered at their insistence, and Jesus himself. It was clear from the setting from the soldiers who stood by, from the acquiescence by which the leaders made sure that they turned over anyone who might be seen as a threat to Roman domination. The famous Pax Romana was enforced with a heavy hand, which Pilate could set in motion with his little finger when he wanted, so the Jewish council was careful to stay on the right side of that hand. But by refusing to answer Pilate's question, 
Are you king of the Jews? No doubt words that he spat in derision. Jesus was refusing his authority over him and claiming trust in another power, not of this world. Jesus was removing Pilate's mask by refusing to quake in fear and revealing the limits of power when one refused to give in to it. It's been called the domination system, the way the Romans ruled by intimidation and violence with promises of peace and prosperity for all who obeyed. Today it still is, the promise of well-being and security for all who play by the rules, importance through owning things, happiness through progress, safety through wealth, meaning through winning. But these masks cannot hide their inability to fulfill what they claim. For beneath the masks, we see too many who are depressed and anxious, numbing themselves on medication, fighting suicide, addictions, and desperation. Remarkable how dysfunctional and unhappy we have become, given our prosperity. Jesus' refusal to bow down to Roman power continues to confront our own willingness to acquiesce to values that are bankrupt. The fifth lesson is from Mark 15, verses 32 to 47. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. 
those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled the sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and Hoses, and Salome. These used to follow him and provided him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Amaritia, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled the stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Hoses, saw where the body was laid. They really wanted a superhero. They wanted a warrior. They wanted a Zeus or a Jupiter who would throw thunderbolts at their enemies and chase them into the Mediterranean Sea. They wanted someone who could carry them all on his shoulders and replace Roman power with Jewish power. They wanted immortality. But what they got was death, ugly, unseemly, gory death, and a man whose call to God to save him went unheeded. They got a man who died as we all must die, and his vulnerability showed that the mask that they had all put on him trying to make him someone different than he was, could no longer remain in place. When the temple curtain was torn in two, no longer was the Divine One hiding in heaven. In that ugly, unseemly, gory death, in that most human of all experiences, the Divine was somehow present in the very thing we fear the most. We still want our God to be distant, immortal, infallible. We still want God to fix the messes in which we find ourselves as individuals and as a society. We still want God to be pure, untouched by the muck and mud of human life. But at the cross, the mask of holy otherness was taken away to reveal the true face of God, a face that endures and experiences what we must and refuses to run away from it. It is a face that confronts power with helplessness, hatred with love, domination with vulnerability, defeat with mercy, death with life. We wanted the superhero to solve it all for us. We are given a dying victim stripped of mask and clothing who was left wearing only love.
Let us pray. Through hearing the story of Jesus in Jerusalem, we are confronted by the revelation not only of you, but of us. We see you in the actions of Christ, but ourselves in the actions of those who turned his triumph into tragedy. The maneuvering of the religious leaders, the greed of Judas, the noisy boast of Peter, the drowsiness of the disciples, the cry of the crowd, the taunts of the passers-by. We recognize these responses because we have known many of them firsthand and know once again that our masks have been removed and our true selves exposed. Were we there when they crucified our Lord? We were not God, but we are when they crucify you again. Forgive us when we side with the crucifiers against the crucified. We think of those who continue to suffer in Yemen, in Syria, and in China, where hate reigns and genocides are repeated against the apathy of the West. We think of those in our own midst who have been left without care during a pandemic, those who are mistrusted for speaking truth, or who have been treated unjustly because of their skin color, or the citizenship on their passports, or the gender of those to whom they are attracted, or the clothes that they wear. Restore us to hope, God. May we carry the cross with as much commitment as we sing about it. There are many for whom we should intercede, but we especially think of those who have been victims of our faithless witness those who look to us for generosity but are repelled by our greed, those who look to us for boldness but are put off by our hesitation, those who look to us for forthrightness but are muted by our silence, those who look to us for compassion but are stunned by our indifference. Deliver us from the weakness with which we have victimized those who have turned to us for strength and give them your spirit that when we stumble, they will not fall. Guide us, redeem us, make us whole, that this journey may not be our downfall, but our rising up. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Oh,